He, uh, uh, who was Matthew, by the way? Who was he? Huh? Who said that? His name means gift from God. Gift from God. What, Sister Andina, who was he? He was a tax collector. So I, I, we're going to see that a little bit of that brought out today in this lesson, I believe. All right? And, of course, he talks about Jesus as what? Joseph's legal heir to the throne of, of Israel. He gives Joseph's genealogy here in this, in this book. Who gives Mary's genealogy? What gospel gives Mary's genealogy? Luke. Luke. All right, that was his literal genealogy. Through Joseph, he was supposed to have the crown of the throne, or he was supposed to be the king of Israel. He was a legitimate heir to the, to the throne of Israel. All right, go to Matthew, the 21st chapter now. Matthew chapter 21. Talking about the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When I was going to the seminary in Brother Madden's classes, we had to memorize the whole New Testament. Not verse for verse, but subject matter. From Matthew through Revelation, you had to tell where one subject began and the other one ended. And now just think about that for just a minute. How important is that? If you did that, you wouldn't be out on some twilight zone heresy, would you? Because who's he speaking? Who's speaking? Who's he speaking to? And what's the subject? Basic, basically, are who, what, where, when, and why. You'd at least get that. So many preachers get up and they preach out of context, don't they? They'll take something and they'll uh, just like diving off of a diving board into the ocean. They just use the scripture to try to teach what they are going to say. There comes in one of our best PR men right there, Dr. Jones. <laughs> All right, Matthew 21 and verse 1 now. And uh, when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage. What does Bethpage mean? Bethpage. Beth means what? Huh? Brother Roger, you're my Hebrew scholar in here. What does that mean? You know? Beth. That's in Hebrew. That's Beth. Okay? And that means house. All right. If you look up in Brown, Driver, and Briggs on page 108, that you will find that. All right. I have written that down so many times that I remember this. You know, if you do something enough, you remember. <laughs> All right. I go through the whole through the whole book of Genesis, and I'm writing down every word and what they mean, and all the roots and the oh, okay. Beth Page means house of figs. House of figs, and Bethany means house of figs or house of dates. The same thing. All right, so remember this because this is very important. All right, later on. Bethlehem, house of bread. Lahem. Lahem is bread. House of bread. Anything where you see Beth on the front of it means house. All right, house. Bethula. 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 What is, the, what is that term? Some of you have heard me speak of that term before. That's a Hebrew term. Bethula. Bethula. What does Bethulah mean? Bethulah. Virgin. One that's guarded in the house. The virgin that's guarded in the house. Guarded. Alma is another Hebrew word for young woman. Okay. Let's go on now. <coughs> Beth made to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples. Now he's going to send out two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her, and untie them and bring them to me. Now he's going back to Zechariah 9 and 9. Now Matthew puts down and he brings out that to bring the colt of the donkey. The colt of a donkey. By the way, the colt of a donkey, this donkey is probably white. How many of you ever seen a white donkey? 
I say, you, there's some white donkeys down in Mexico, caught a few white donkeys down in Mexico. What, Brother Bill? You what? Oh, you own the white donkey. All right. A white donkey. Now, white stands for what, mainly? Purity. Okay, a white donkey. Now, this donkey had never been ridden before. Now, the donkeys over there in the Middle East are a whole lot different than these wild jackasses here. I'm going to tell you something right now. There's a whole lot of difference. I uh, used to work in Nevada on ranches up there, and I was a horse trainer a long time ago. That's why I'm so bent and crooked. I'm just about as crooked as a corkscrew now. I was straight and strong back then. <laughs> but all these horseshoe prints and everything else all over me and teeth marks and whatever. We'd get on those wild donkeys up there. I'd start trying to train them to ride, and they'd reach around and grab your leg in their mouth. You ever had them do that, Brother Bill? Yeah. Couldn't get you off, so they'd try to drag you off. And you'd carry a pretty good-sized stick with you and go, boom, 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 boom. One time, one of them around, reached around and grabbed me by the leg. It was actually the left leg. And he wouldn't turn loose of it. I reached down, and I grabbed him by the ear, and I bit his ear. And I tell you what, we were working on each other. <clears throat> and that donkey had a hole, <laughs> a swallow mark on the end of his ear from that on. God, I tell you what, I bit him hard enough where he finally turned loose. You have to get rough with them sometimes. But this is not the kind of donkeys this was. Now, Brother uh, Abe, you came out to my house, and Chris, you came out to my house this last week and brought that... Uh, treadmill out, which you really appreciate. Marilyn is really getting in good shape. And uh, <clears throat> she worked on it, what, 11 minutes, 15, 16 minutes or something today, this morning, when she got up. But she came out there, and, and I have a lot of chickens. My chickens, I don't eat. I eat their eggs and all that kind of stuff, but I don't eat. They're all pets to me. And they'll jump up, and they'll get in my hand, and they'll whatever. I had a duck out there that I could whistle wherever I was out there and go, like that. And that duck had just come running, and he'd run, and he'd stand on my foot and put his head in my hand. Everything loves me out there, you know. They like me. When they see me come out there, they'll jump up on their little roofs, and they'll run around. They'll put their little heads like that, looking through, wanting me to pick them up or feed them something or whatever. I get along good with animals. Even my pig, well, I had her 13 years. She wasn't food. She was my buddy. Anyway, uh, this donkey was an animal. Now, in the book of Genesis, when God created animals and put them in, in Adam's care, what were the animals for? What were they, why did God create all the animals? Why did, why did he create all the animals? What? For his companions. His companions. They were companions. They weren't food. They didn't have... Man was not given any man animal to eat at all. By the way, just might want to tell you this. Before the flood, how long did people live? Hundreds and hundreds of years. Was man ever given any animals to eat before the flood? No. After the flood, how long did people live? <laughs> well, we have Abraham lived a long time. Jacob lived a long time. They lived over 100 years old. But I'll tell you what, after that, uh, they were, how many, how many years did God give man to live? In King James it says three score and ten. How many is that? Seventy years. Anything over seventy, that's a gift. Okay, that's a gift. Anything over seventy, that's a gift. All right. <laughs> Anything over 70, that's extra. All right. But just think about that. Now, man didn't have uh, vegetation. The longest living religious organization, I, don't, I didn't say they were right by any means. What people in what religion live longer than anybody else? No. <laughs> huh? Vegetarians, the Seventh-day Adventists. They live longer and healthier lifestyles because most of them don't eat meat. They don't look healthy to me. <laughs> yeah. 
I was going to be a vegetarian one time. I went to this holistic medical school for about three years. And I was learning a lot about medicine. Well, this guy was kind of encouraging me to be a uh, vegetarian. And I would rather be a vegetarian than a meat eater, to tell you the truth. But I was dying. I literally, I had the shakes. I was, this, I was in a total mess. Sick. Terrible, terribly sick. And according to them, I was doing fine. I had that complexion and everything, you know, all that different complexion and everything. I went to my regular doctor, and by the way, he was a Seventh-day Adventist. His name was uh, Robert Sibley. Wonderful man, great doctor. And I was sitting there just shaking. My blood pressure was sky high. My pulse was erratic and all this kind of stuff. He said, what on earth are you doing to yourself? I said, well, I'm a, a vegetarian and all this kind of stuff, and I've been taking all these cleansing things. He said, you're killing yourself. He said, Jim, he said, what nationality are you? I said, well, I'm American Indian. He said, well, I knew that. He said, what did your people eat for thousands of years? Well, I said, they ate buffalo and venison. He said, high protein. He said, you go on the reservations today, and they've changed the diet of your people, and your people are dying at 30 and 40 years old. He said, your system requires lots of protein. Now, he said, I am Anglo-Saxon. He said, I can eat three or four ounces of meat a week or sometimes that much in a month, and that's enough for me. But he said, there's things in meat that you have to have. He said, your body has acquired an absolute need for meat and high protein. He said, you go home and you eat a steak. And let me give you a vitamin B shot in the IV. And he did that to me, and I, boy, I started feeling better. I went home, and I, and I just turned around, turned it around. I like to kill myself. But we, for thousands of years, we ate high protein. American Indians did, and it does make a difference. And I looked into what he said later on. He said, your digestive system is shorter than Anglo-Saxon. He said, every animal that is a vegetarian has a very long digestive system. Every animal that is a carnivorous has a shorter digestive because it'll absorb all the mineral. It's a lot easier to digest meat than vegetation. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? Weird. Well, the animals. The animals. Let's think about it. This animal was, uh, had never been broken. He wasn't like a wild donkey out of Saline Valley, Brother Bill, or Eureka out there in Toronto or something like that. You catch, have you ever caught those? Did you go rope those donkeys out there? I roped one, but I've ridden one, and the little, little pretty good. Boy, they, and they never give up, do they? They don't give up. You don't have one broke after five years. I was in a movie one time up there in Nevada. I was doing, the, they were doing a movie up there called The Nevada Story the Nevada story. And they had me training these donkeys, and they said, oh, here's one of the wild animals of the, of the de Nevada desert and everything else, and here's a guy that's riding it, and they got me out there. And they had all these best boys all around, movies and cameras all over the place. I mean, we were just, there's a lot of people on those movies, a lot of people. Donkeys don't like to cross water, do they? They won't cross the stream at all, these wild donkeys. They, they, they're very leery about anything. The donkey came up to this stream, and here I said, I can't get him to go across this stream like this. You know, when he came up there like that, and all the guys, they came around and picked me and the donkey up and put us across the stream. On the, I was on the donkey, they just picked us all up and put us over. The, those guys get with it, man. Well, I got him across the stream out there, and we were going down the road, and he said, kick him out and make him trot. Kick him out and make him trot. So I kicked him out and made him trot like that. All of a sudden, he decided he wanted to buck Bill. And I wasn't riding any surf single or anything like that. They didn't give me time to put a surf single or anything on him. And boy, he just, right in the middle of it, he just bucked. And away I went up in the air. He just catapulted me like I shot me out of a slingshot. And the flat of my back, I fell on the ground, on the camera, you know. Well, this donkey here, Jesus didn't have to uh, didn't have to train him. He didn't have to buck him out. He didn't have to put blinds on him or, 
or anything else. Saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey and tied there, and a colt with her, untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you or something to you, you say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them with you. He will send them with you immediately. Now, if you go to the different places of Luke the night. Uh, Luke the 19th chapter and Mark 11 and John 12 you'll find out that somebody did say hey what are you doing with my animal and they said the Lord has need of him Jehovah has need of him and they'll say go ahead Jehovah this is for the Lord's service all right now this took place that what was spoken through the prophet, now the prophet of what? Zechariah the prophet 9 and 9, might be, say, might be fulfilled saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you. Your king is coming to you. Daughter of Zion. Where's Zion? Where's Zion? You remember over here? On the, the city of Jerusalem where Zion was? It's right back up there behind Moriah. It's a little bit higher than Moriah, up on Zion. And there is where they built the first uh, church, the first church, the first church. Mm-hmm. Yes. Sorry for the quick question. In verse 12, the donkey that is talking about, was it a female? Because it says by her colt. Her, it was, the, the colt was a boy, a, little, a male donkey, but it was a female donkey. The woman, the girl, the mother was a female, of course. Okay, she was a female, and then we have a colt, a young colt. Uh, tied. And by the way, all the kings rode on white donkeys. At this period of time, the kings, all of David's sons rode on white donkeys. A donkey is, a, is an animal of peace. You don't take a donkey into war, because a donkey won't go into war. A donkey will never go any place where he's in danger, nor will a mule. A horse, war horses, are different. Now back in in the Civil War days, even way back in, in uh, Genghis Khan days and all of this, they, wore, they had some really strong bits they put in the horse's mouth to hold them. And when you get out there during the Civil War, uh, generals and, and Officers, they would have three or four horses shot out from underneath them as they were charging into battle and whatever. But when you're all these guns and cannons are going off, you have to have control over them, even a horse. A horse will go into battle, but a mule and a donkey won't. And but they have to have very powerful bits on them, and some of those bits would just cut their teeth, their their mouths to pieces. Terrible. You've seen some of those brother brother wrecks. They were bits that were long shanks. And here is a, the bit that goes in the horse's mouth, like this. And some of them were really tall, a lot of leverage. And then some of them had big rings on them that went around the jaw of the horse that you could actually break a horse's jaw. These are some of the bits that they used on the war horses, the war horses. That was, it was near there. Later on, they built a church within uh, 100 A.D. or something in that area, and that's where they had one of the first churches. But then Catholicism got involved. So after that, Catholicism, after about 300, you know, uh, Constantine, Constantine's mother went over there, all these places, and built churches all over. That was during that period of time. So we won't chase that rabbit too much. And it says, and, and now what happened? Jesus gets on the colt. He said, gentle and mounted upon a donkey. The king comes to you gentle. He's not the war king this time. When Jesus comes back in the book of Revelation, what's he going to be riding? A white horse. A white charger. A white war horse. The first time he came, he came riding on a white donkey, a animal of peace and gentleness gentle and mounted upon a donkey, even upon a colt, and the foal of a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had directed them. 
and brought the donkey and the colt and laid them on their garments on them that they made a saddle out of their garments on the on the uh, donkey on which he sat and most of the multitude spread their garments in the road they threw them down on the pathway of the donkey to make a road for him a royal road because this is the king the king of Israel most of the multitude spread their garments in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road and these are palm branches and whatever they're they're making a pathway for the king and the multitudes going before him those who followed after him were crying out Hosanna and what is Hosanna what does Hosanna mean Brother John, do you remember what all that is? What? What? No. Hosanna. Hosanna. What does Hosanna mean? What? Lord save us. Lord save us. Lord save us. Brother John, you want to write that down? <laughs> <laughs> Lord save us Lord save us save us Jehovah Hosanna son of David did they say who he was who was he who was he son of David is he the right heir to the throne of Israel the right heir to the throne of Israel he's the one this is the one this is the one that should have been on the throne of Israel not Herod Herod was Esau's descendant. Jesus was a legitimate descendant to the throne of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch Hashem, as what they call some of these uh, modern uh, uh, synagogues that believe in Jesus. All right. Blessed is he that came in the name of the Lord. Hosea in the highest. The Lord save us the most high. All right. Is that making exactly who he is? Psalm 118, 19 through 27. Let's go to Psalm 118, 19 through 27. Psalm 118. Let's look at that quickly. Open to the gates of the righteousness. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. Remember who, where he was coming through? Where did he come? What gate did he come through when he rode in here? The eastern gate? Remember, they shut that eastern gate later on, and no one will come through until the Lord comes back through that eastern gate. All right? I shall enter through them, and I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. This is the Lord's gate. The righteous will enter through it. I shall give thanks to thee, for thou hast answered me, and thou hast become my... See, look at that. You have become, God has become my salvation. Hosanna means what? Lord save us. Jehovah save us. The stone which the builders rejected. Who was that? That Jesus, in all the parables he had been telling to the Jews, what is all of this fulfilling? What is all of this fulfilling? Every parable that they had. Do you know how many prophecies were fulfilled when Jesus rode into Jerusalem? Hundreds when he rode into Jerusalem. The very day that he was to ride into Jerusalem was prophesied in the book of Daniel. The very day when he was going to ride into Jerusalem. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Who was the rock? Who was the rock? Was it Peter? Was Peter the rock in Matthew 16, 18? Who was the rock in Matthew 16, 18? Jesus, Jesus was the rock. All right? He's the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. This is the day when he would ride in Jerusalem. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O oh Lord, do save, we beseech thee. Here we have the word Hosanna. Put out, O oh Lord, do save us. O oh Jehovah, do save us. O oh Lord, we beseech thee, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, 
and he has given us light. And Jesus said what in John the third chapter? I am the light that is coming to the world. But you loved what? Darkness rather than light. And when the light came in the world, it made your deeds evil. The Lord is God. He has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I give thanks to you. Thou art my God, I extol thee. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. For his loving kindness is everlasting. That's what they were saying. They were quoting the whole psalm. They weren't just quoting part of it. They quoted the whole thing. They're saying this. When Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, and when he quoted Psalm 22 and verse 1, and in the Hebrew, what is that? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. All right? He quoted that on the cross of Calvary. When he quoted that one verse, they had to read the whole psalm because he meant the whole psalm. And that talks about what? Psalm 22 talks about what? The suffering and dying Messiah. The suffering Messiah. Let's go on a little bit further now. Blessed he comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? Who is this coming in here? Who is this coming in like a king? coming into his throne. Who is this? And the multitudes were saying, this is the prophet, Jesus. And what does Jesus mean? What does Jesus mean? It's Joshua. But what does Joshua mean? What, what does it mean? What does it mean? No, that's Jehovah, he who shall become. Sister Ann Dino? Je Jehovah saves. That's what Jesus means, Jehovah saves from Nazareth and it said in the in the Old Testament scriptures out of a root of dry ground will I call forth my son from the root of dry ground which is Nazareth or Nazareth all right in Galilee verse number 12 now we start on to another one we go on to a different subject Jesus is taking over his kingdom the king grabs his throne and takes authority he tells them at this point, you are bankrupt. In the ancient temples, every ancient pagan temple had a priest that was a banker in each temple. And I know some of you have heard this story a lot of times, but some of you haven't. Okay? And out there in the radio world and the, and the web world, they haven't heard it. So I'll tell it. The word bankrupt comes from a word means broken bench. In a pagan temple, a priest was set aside to be the banker or the one that was responsible. People would take their money. All of the old banks in America had great big vaulted and usually had eagles and all kinds of stuff, you know, up in the big ceilings and everything because they were made after the pagan temples in yonder years. In all of these pagan temples, they would have a priest that was a banker and he would set up his table out there it was a bench a table and he would sit beside it sit in front of it or behind it that is and people would come and put their money and deposit their money and they could come back and withdraw money from their account and there was a priest that was set aside to be the banker now if this priest proved to be unholy if he proved to be dishonest the first thing they would do is they would come and break his bench and say the bank is bankrupt. He is, he, is, he is bankrupt. He is no good. Then they would take him out and publicly beat him. And most of the time they would execute him. And during the Roman times they would even crucify him. Okay? Now, let's take all of this background. When Jesus comes into the temple area, now let's remember what he's doing here. What is he telling Israel, national Israel? What is, what is the message to them right now? Let's look at it. And Jesus entered, entered the temple. Now, he didn't go into the temple. He didn't go into the temple area. He didn't go there. He went into the area, the temple area. Turn that old machine over. <coughs> 
He went into the temple area. And uh, kept on casting out all those who were buying and selling in the temple area. They had a market there. And these uh, Jews were corrupt. They were corrupt. Guess who was responsible for all of everything that took place in the temple area? Who was responsible for it? Who was responsible for everything that took place in the temple area? In Israel at this time, at this day, who was responsible? The high priest. Thank you, brother. You got an A plus today. The high priest was responsible for all this. So Jesus is condemning the high priest. He's condemning the Sanhedrin because they were responsible. He was condemning all of the polity, the polity of Israel at this time. And he kept on casting out all those who were buying and selling in the temple area. They would buy and sell all kinds of stuff in there. But the one things they were selling, you would come in there, if you brought in a dove or two doves in a cage to make an offering, for that was the least, the, the cheapest offering you could make if you were poor. But they would bring in lambs, they would bring in goats, they would bring in cattle, all this stuff. But they would say, oh, well, this has got a flaw in it. They would go over it and say, well, now, wait a minute, this has got a flaw in it. But now you have to go over to the banker, go over to the banker and change your money, change your money over there with the banker. You can't buy any offering with any, anything but the temple money. So they had to go over there and they would have to exchange their money. And of course, the guy that exchanged their money charged them money to do that. So he was making money. And then he would go over there and these people that had been set up, the political appointees, there was there were at Bethlehem, Bethlehem, in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was what? The shepherds there when the when the, when they heard the angels saying at Bethlehem, what was Bethlehem? The, the the pasture out there below the city of Bethlehem. What was it? That's where they kept and guarded those sheep that were marked for sacrifice. They were perfect without spot or blemish. They would bring those in there and they would sell them at a high price. So they were making money over all this stuff. So all these animals there, all these birds were out here. You know what Jesus did? He went in there and tore down the pens, turned the animals loose, opened up the bird cages and let them fly away, turned over the money changers' tables and said, you people are all bankrupt. All of you are corrupt. You're all criminals. overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves, busted open the, thank you brother, busted open the uh, dove cages and turned them loose. They were free because the real sacrifice was here. Those were just looking forward to him. And he uh, said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And Isaiah 56, 7, through Isaiah 56 and 7 and Jeremiah 7 and 11. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a cave for robbers, a hideout, hole in the wall gang, a hideout. My great-great-grandfather used to go up to the Tabletop Mountains. And back there he had a cave where he had bootleg whiskey, where he would bootleg whiskey and everything, and he'd stay back in there time. Sam Paul would go back there and he would he'd hang out in that cave. And he'd have food and everything back in that cave. A den, a place of robbers and thieves. The outlaws would come back there and they'd hide out. A dinner, a, a, a robber's cave. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Now he's doing his job, isn't he? The blind and the lame came to him, and he's doing his job. He's healing them. Why did he heal them? Why did he heal these people? Why did Jesus heal these people when he walked in there? He was proving that he was the Messiah. 
And he was proving to them what the millennium could really be like. Jesus came right here. He came right here. Do you know if they would have accepted him, he could have brought in his kingdom, the millennial kingdom? They would have never had any need for food. There would have been no sick people, nothing. Because here, our Messiah, our king, has power over death and life and over all. The storms would have stopped. Did you know that? There would have never been another tornado. There would have never been another flood. Jesus proved that he had power over everything. But did they want him? No. Israel didn't want him. Let's go on a little further. And the blind and the lame came to him. Now who was the only one that could heal the blind? No one had ever healed a blind man in history, had they? Only the Messiah. So he's proving that I am the Messiah King. I am the right man. I am the son of David. And the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But, strong adversity conjunction, but, when the chief priests, these are the head priests, they are K, Eres. All right, the head chiefs and the scribes. Who are the scribes? All right, the, who were they? The county clerks. And every synagogue there was a scribe. He was like the county clerk. He would put the seal on. He wrote down everything that took place. So here we have that chief priest, and we have the county clerks, saw the wonderful things that he had done. These are the miraculous things, the great signs and wonders. And the children were crying out in the temple saying, What? Jehovah save us. Jehovah save us. To the son of David. And they became happy. Were they happy? Were these chief priests and scribes, were they happy? What's it say? They were in angry. They were indignant. They were insulted because they were the authors of corruption. They were the authors of false religion. You go back in the third chapter of the book of Genesis and verse number 14 and 15. Genesis 13, four, Genesis 3, 14 and 15. Go back there. We have the author of false religion in the Garden of Eden. We have old Satan himself. Go back there for a moment. Genesis, the third chapter, verses 14 and 15. Let's go all the way back to verse number 10. What had happened here is... Uh, as man and woman had sinned, Brother Bill, the, woman, the, the, the man's wife took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then she offered it to him, and he willingly took it. She was deceived, Brother Bill, but the man was not deceived. He was a scoundrel, and he took of it. And verse number 9, And the Lord called the man and said to him, Where are you? Now, do you think God didn't know where Adam was? He wanted Adam to know where he was. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I became afraid, and I became naked. So I hid myself. And he said, uh, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said to the woman, Who? The woman. See there, Brother Bill? The woman. Who you gave me. This is what you call blame shifting. Yeah, I, I, I ate of the tree. I did it. He didn't say that. He said, it was your fault, Jehovah. That woman, the woman you gave me, <coughs> is your fault. And the man said, the woman that you gave to me, be with me. She gave to me uh, from the tree, and I ate. And the woman, and the Lord God, Jehovah Elam, said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent. We nahashi shiani is what she said in Hebrew. We nahashi shiani. And the serpent, he deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Now God is talking, Jehovah is talking to the old Nahash. And the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed you are more than all the cattle, 
all the domesticated animals, more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall walk. He said, your belly will cling to the dirt. This is prophecy of what was going to happen to Satan. Satan is a glorious being in the Hallel. Lucifer means light carrier, Hallel. The praise and the glory of God. The highest, most perfect angel of all. And he sinned. But he said to old Satan, he said, from now on you're going to be in a constant state of humility. I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to put your face in the dirt. I'm going to rub your nose in the dirt. And your belly's going to cling to the dirt. Cursed you are more than all the cattle. And on your belly you shall go. On your belly you shall walk in dust. And in dirt you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put hatred, active hatred between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. And you shall bruise his... And, and he shall bruise you on the head. He's going to deal a death-dealing blow to you, but you will have a crippling, he'll have a crippling experience with you. Now let's go back over here in Matthew. The old devil is going to be brought down. The old devil is, a, is the author of all false religion, and the old devil was the author of everything that was going on in Jerusalem. Had been for many years. These people became indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, I have you never read. Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, thou hast prepared a praise for me. Psalm 8 and verse 2. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Now he's going to tell a parable. The next verse, the very next verses, he's going to tell a parable that it describes these rats to the T. Bethany means what? House of figs. Figs. House of figs. House of figs. Right there is where we'll start next week. Brother David and Brother Brett, it's yours. Thank you for your attention. And enduring those hard seats. I guess we'll give you an A minus for today, Jim. A minus for Jim today. A minus. <laughs> that buggy, you know, it's A plus. All right, we have the same uh, materials needed for the chapter migrant camp.